morning, everybody. Just waiting for my slides. There we go. Okay. okay. My talk today is going to be on an overview of the non-clinical safety assessment in drug development. It's actually what the pharmacology and toxicology reviewers do at FDA, and what do we do? Uh, what do we uh, review? So the drug review process is actually a multidisciplinary stepwise process, which involves evaluation of animal and human safety and efficacy data. So it's very important for any drug that we work on to look for evidence of safety and efficacy. It's really not, not ethical to get anything on the mar market that is not efficacious. It has to be efficacious, and of course, it has to be safe. So the farm talks reviewers, we um, assess the safety data to make sure before going into human that the drug is going to be safe. So some definitions for our work related to our work is, of course, toxicology, which is the adverse effects of xenobiotic. Xenobiotic is anything strange that goes into the body. And I have some references that, uh, here for uh, some of our uh, books that we refer to. And also, of course, pharmacology. Pharmacology is the study of the drug itself, from a metabolism to mechanism of action to what happens to the drug itself, and also some references. For, for toxicology, uh, Paracelsus is our grandfather. And what Paracelsus said at his time in the 1400s and 1500s is all substances are poisons. There is none which is not a poison. The right dose differentiate a poison from a remedy. So when we review any toxicology study, that's, that's actually what we look at. We look at toxicology. And everything is toxic depending on the dose. Even water can kill you if you drink a lot of water. So everything really is toxic depending on the dose. This is very important in our toxicology field. Now, for therapy versus toxicology, what we really want to be for a good drug is to be in this therapeutic window. So you want as many patients to respond to the drug, to be efficacious for as many uh, patients as possible with very little toxicity. So this would be a perfect drug to be in this area when you do drug development. So uh, we do pharmacology and toxicology, of course. So pharmacology, we look at two kinds of pharmacology. We look at the pharmacokinetics, which is usually what the body does to the drug. And that deals with the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drug. And we also look at the pharmacodynamics of the drug. And this is what the drug does to the body. And this cover the biochemical and physiological effects of the drug and their mechanism of action. What are INDs and, NDA, and NDAs? An IND, the way I look at an IND, of course, you know, the IND is an investigational new drug application. But the way I look at it, it is a request from a sponsor, from you, to conduct clinical trials. It's so usually the, um, the sponsor have, have a chemical, have a, a, a drug, and uh, they've done some um, uh, non-clinical studies, and they have an idea what the clinical trials are going to, uh, to be. So, or they've done all that, and they're, they're um, submitting the protocol for the clinical trials plus the non-clinical plus the chemistry to us, and they're actually asking us, can we start clinical trial? So our job as PharmTox reviewer is to look at the safety of this IND and decide if they can go into a clinical trials or not. Now, the NDA, to me, is a request to market a drug. That's when the sponsor has done everything, all the non-clinical, all the chemistry, all the clinical trials. And they're submitting everything to us. And they're asking us, can we uh, market this drug? So the stages of drug development starts with a pre-IND, IND, which covers phase one, two, and three clinical trials, an NDA, and post-marketing. A pre-IND, the pre-IND is actually very important. It's a, 
it's um, it's like the way I look at it too is like a, a, a consultation that you can have with FDA. It's a free consultation. You don't have to go to a consult and pay a lot of money. You can to come to F FDA and ask us the questions you want, and we will give you the answers for free. So it's usually when you have it's it's early on, and it should be really early on in your development. It's when you have a chemical, you know the the properties, the chemical properties of your chemical or your drug, and uh, you've done some uh, non-clinical, or maybe you just have an idea of what you're going to do, and you also have an idea of what the clinical trials are going to, to, to be. So you put all those in a package, and you write a lot of questions. What, what are your questions? It's very important to have your questions written in your package. If you don't ask us questions, we don't know how to answer you. We don't know what the problem is. So then you send us this um, package, and we will either give you a meeting or we'll just answer you, um, you know, as a written answer. In my division, most we don't give meetings that much because we get a lot of free INBs and there's really no time. So we usually uh, send a written um, uh, response to you. But if the sponsor insists on a meeting and there's something really important, we do give these meetings. So the, the advantage of having a pre-IND is to avoid premature submission of the IND. If you submit the IND and there's a problem in it, you might go on hold. But if you submit a pre-IND, you don't go on hold. It's a, it's a consultation um, issue. And then you also avoid unnecessary uh, non-clinical study. You might think that you need to do these studies, but when you talk to us, we tell you, no, not really. Or it could be the opposite. You plan not to do these studies, and we, we tell you, you know, to get a good IND, you need to do these studies. And there will be a discussion with whatever questions you have. So my advice is to really take advantage of free IND meetings with FDA. Uh, this is um, like Drug Development 101, and it just gives you an idea of uh, how, how this works at FDA. So the white uh, background is the timing of the sponsor, and the blue is the timing of FDA. So before submitting to FDA, there's a preclinical research, synthesis and purification of the drug, animal testing, they start with short-term protocol, uh, clinical protocol, work and um, the IRB work. So when all this is done, uh, a pre-IND might um, happen here also. And then when all is done, the IND is submitted here. So FDA has, um, or the division has 30 days to look at all this data that's submitted and decide if the clinical trials can start or not. And that's by the end of the 30 days. So if everything is OK and we tell the sponsor you can start your clinical trials, they start with phase one, phase two, phase three. So they have all this time. This could take years to, to finish all these studies. Sometimes there might be an accelerated development um, review and uh, some treatment uh, INDs, emergency INDs. Then the long-term non-clinical studies are ongoing until everything is done. And then the NDA will be submitted here. And then it will be back to FDA to do the review of the NDA. And that would be either like eight months if it's a priority review, or a year if it's um, not a priority review. An advisory committee might happen here. If everything is OK. The drug gets off the, on the market. If not, goes back to the sponsor for more work, and so on. So the studies that are needed for um, non-clinical studies for safety, uh, we, we get pharmacology studies. Pharmacology studies are really not, not required for safety. However, the, the sponsors do them because they want to know what the mechanism of action is for the drug, how the drug works. So, and they submit them to us. And they are useful to us because knowing how the drug works will help us understand the toxicology when we review the toxicology studies. And these studies usually are in vitro studies for mechanism of action or in vivo studies and so on. But for safety, these are the studies that the sponsors really need to submit. 
And um, there's a list of these studies, safety pharmacology, PK, ADME, general toxicology, local tolerance if the drug was going to be given um, subcutaneously or IV, uh, genotoxicity, carcinogenicity, reproductive toxicology, and some other special studies. And these studies need to be GLP, and that's good laboratory practice. They have to be very good quality studies, because we're going to depend on uh, the safety in humans, we depend on those studies for safety. We do have some more slides. <laughs> okay, I'll just I'll just continue. Um, uh, I think the the next uh, uh, slide is on ICH and. It's um, the question is how do sponsors know um, what to do? You know, they need to do all these studies. So how would they know what to do? We've got an ICH process, and the ICH process it was established in 1990, and um, it's a, a group of um, the agencies and okay, here we go. It's regulators and industry representative from Europe, Japan, and the United States. And they get together and they write guidances. Um, this is when it started in 1990. Now there are more countries that are involved in this process. And uh, they write guidances on safety, quality, and efficacy. And you know that from when you see it, uh, ICHS, that means it's for safety. ICHQ, that's for quality, and, and so on. So, and, and um, countries that follow, or sponsors that follow the ICH, their uh, studies should really be sub, um, accepted in any of these countries. <clears throat> and this is uh, the website. There's the ICH uh, website that you can see all those guidances, plus uh, it's also available on the FDA guidances. Now, <clears throat> it's important to know also that it's not just ICH guidances. FDA have their own guidances. If you notice here at the bottom, um, there's an FDA guidance, while all the others are ICH. ICH M3 R2 is our uh, for farm talks for uh, for non-clinical. This is our major guidance because it tells you everything you should know about um, um, non-clinical. And it's an M3. When you see an M, it it means multidisciplined. So it covers you know non-clinical, clinical, quality, everything. So the same thing with Europe or Japan. They do have their own guidances also. So safety pharmacology, these are the studies that the sponsors have to do uh, for safety. And these are uh, studies that investigate a potential undesirable effect on vital organs, like the cardiovascular system, respiratory system, and central nervous system. These are the core battery. But um, <clears throat> it could be also more organs. If, the, if they know, if the sponsor knows that the drug have an effect on the kidney or the GI, they need to investigate that. The PK and TK studies, pharmacokinetic and toxicokinetics, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with pharmacokinetic more than the toxicokinetic is the same. It's the kinetics at the toxic dose. Because we, we're toxicologists. We want to see toxic doses. We want to see the toxicity of the drug. So we look at the kinetics at that dose. So these cover the, the ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drug. They um, usually are done with a control in three doses. And uh, we also look at, uh, or the, <clears throat> we need to look at metabolites and the metabolic pathway. Uh, the excretion pathway. And this data is needed because when we go into clinical trials, we start comparing between the animal and the uh, PK and the uh, human PK to look at the toxicity. <clears throat> now, general toxicity, these are the most important studies. And these could be a single dose or a multiple dose. And what we need to understand from these studies are, is uh, what are the target organs of toxicity? Uh, was there a dose response? These studies are also done with a control and at least three doses. 
what is the ma maximum tolerated dose. And the most important thing in this study is to have a no well, which is a no adverse effect level. So we have to have a no well in these studies so that we're going to use that dose to calculate the first in human dose. And then it's always good to know if the effects we see, the toxicity, is it reversible or not when we stop giving the drug to the animal. These tables are from um, <clears throat> uh, the ICHM3 uh, guidance. And it, tell us, it tells us, uh, this is for clinical uh, trial. For, um, to support a clinical trial, we have to have two uh, studies in animals, in a rodent and a non-rodent. The rodent is usually the mouse or the rat, the non-rodent dog or monkey. So the, the dura uh, duration of the clinical trial, if it's up to two weeks, we need a study in both species up to two weeks. If it's two weeks to six months, it's the same. So the bottom line is the animal study should always be equal or longer than the clinical trials. Nevertheless, if it's less, it's not accepted. That would be a hold issue. It has to be equal or longer. For six months, more than six months, this is considered chronic in human. We stop at six months in rodents and nine months in non-rodent because those animals don't live that long. So this is considered um, chronic for them. For uh, marketing, it's a little bit longer. What is requested, uh, required for marketing, if we have a, a clinical, um, <clears throat> uh, it's, the treatment is indicated for two weeks in humans, uh, we need one month and one month. Two weeks to one month, we need three months and three months, and so on. For more than three months, when you go into chronic, six months and nine months. Other studies needed are the genetic toxicity and carcinogenicity. Um, this is the genetic toxicities are important studies, and these are needed to be done early on to make sure that we don't have any. Um, we're not giving drugs that are genotoxic, which means that they might in the future ca cause cancer. Because remember, the first. Um, Clinical trials are usually in healthy volunteers. So you really don't want to give something that is genotoxic to a healthy volunteer that has no benefit of it at all. So it's important to do these studies early on. And carcinogenicity studies are requested when the a drug is going to be given chronically, more than six months continuously, or if it's given intermittently for life. For example, a drug for migraine might take it once a week, you might take it once a month, but for life. So we need to know the carcinogenicity of that drug. Reproductive toxicity study, we have three different kinds of studies. Um, fertility of the adult animals, this is done in rats. And we have embryo fetal development. These, these um, studies are done in rats and rabbits, and they're pregnant rats and rabbits, and to look at the effects of uh, <clears throat> teratogenicity and um, postnatal development of the offspring. So these are like three um, studies to look at all kinds of reproductive toxicity. Now, there is also some special toxicology that might be needed. It all depends on the mechanism of action, the drug class, um, anything that we see during development, we might ask the sponsor, or the sponsor might do that themselves, maybe an immunotoxicity study or a phototoxicity study, or any of those you know, other studies that you don't have to do them unless there's a reason for it. <coughs> now, for us, for farm talks, you, can, you notice most of those studies come early on. So our work is usually early on with the IND, when the IND comes in, and it, you know, it continues all through the drug development. And, and you saw the list, the long list I had for all the studies that are needed. Well, not all these studies are needed when the IND comes in. Uh, what's needed when the IND comes in are the safety pharmacology studies, acute toxicity, or multi-dose. They don't have to be both. If there's a multi-dose study with a good length um, of duration, that should be enough. And in a rodent and a non-rodent. 
And then, uh, like I said, local tolerance in case it's not an oral um, application. And then genotoxicity. Genotoxicity, these are usually three studies that are required. So even if they do two studies at that time, that should be OK. So these are the studies that's needed with an IND. There's no need for carcinogenicity. There's no need for Repro at this time. This is just enough for the IND. So now when we review uh, the IND, when we review all those studies as farm talks, this is what we look for. Was there an effect observed? Is it treatment related? Is it because of the drug? Um, does it appear to be toxicologically significant? Is it reversible? Is it likely to be clinically relevant? And can, it, uh, can the effect be monitored? Because that's what actually our uh, clinician wants to know from us. Because we're looking at the animal study. We're reviewing them. What the medical officer wants to know when they review the protocol is, what do I do with this effect? Is it monitorable or not? For example, if we see uh, liver toxicity, they can look at liver um, uh, enzymes. They can measure that in the clinical trial. So that's something, you know, it's, it's monitorable. It's OK. Uh, if we see um, uh, necrosis, tissue necrosis in the heart of the rat, well, how they're going to look at that, how they're going to monitor that, that's a bigger issue. So then we have to look at what dose did we see there? Was it a very high dose? Do we have safety factor? That might be, um, you know, a, a, a no, no go. That might be a stop or a, or a hold. So this is the way we look at these um, animal studies and review them and how we work with our clinicians at FDA. So now uh, we reviewed all those studies. And how are we going to go from this um, little guy here to this big guy here? So how are we going to calculate the first in human dose? So we have a guidance. This, is, this was the, the, bottom, uh, the, the, the guidance at the bottom of the list, which was an FDA guidance. It is to calculate the maximum recommended start dose in um, humans. And uh, the guidance explains that very well, and that we review and evaluate the animal data. We pick a NOEL from the animal data, and we convert the NOEL to the human equivalent dose, because a dose in a rat is not the same as a dose in human. We have to take into consideration the weight and the surface area, et cetera. And then we select the most sensitive species, and we apply a safety factor. We, we like the safety factor to be a 10, but the 10 could be less, could be more, depending on the toxicity. So this is the safety mar margin, is the NOEL in the animals over the maximum recommended dose in humans. To calculate the human equivalent dose, uh, the, uh, the animal dose in milligram per kilogram times animal weight in kilogram divided by human weight in kilogram to the power 0.33. I don't know who's going to do this. You know, I don't really know how to do the power 0.33 anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reviewers, thanks to the reviewers who wrote the guidance, they came up with this table. And instead of, and you can see, the, uh, this is what they used. They actually did use the, this calculation, this uh, equation to make this table. So you have a body weight of different species. And uh, this is the range weight, body surface area. They used this to calculate and came up with these two tables. And these are the ones that we use all the time. And it is to convert uh, the animal dose in, uh, you know, to, to the human equivalent. You either divide by this number or you multiply by this number, which makes it very easy. For example, for the rats, um, you do 6. You, I, I like the division. It's easier. I usually divide by 6. The dog, you divide by 2. The monkey, you divide by 3. And you immediately uh, you know, change the, the doses. <laughs> so here's an example. So if we have a, a study, a rat study that gave us an OL of 10, um, for to change it to the human equivalent, you either multiply by this number or divide by 6. These Numbers come from the table, gives us a 1.6 milligram per kilogram. That's the head. 
And um, remember, uh, medic medical doctors use milligram. When you take a, take a medicine, you say it's 100 milligram, it's a 50 milligram. When we do experiments with animal, we do milligram per kilogram. So we had to transfer it to our, you know, uh, to make it easier for everybody. So we use a 60 kilogram body weight human, and that uh, gives us a 97.2, and we use a 10, divide by 10, it gives us a 10 milligram. This just happened to be 10 and 10 here. The dog, Noel was 5, we do the same calculation. Of course, it's a different number here because it comes from the dog. And this gave us a 16 milligram. So um, a first in human dose that is safe could be 10 and could be 16. So which one would you recommend? 10? Good, you're conservative. That's right. Okay, so then when, when we've done all this, uh, we go back to the IND and we check, do we have um, the dose, duration, route of administration, everything is fine, we have an MTD, we have an OL, we calculated safety factors, it's reasonably safe. If it's not, this could be a hold issue. So we will recommend to the team that this drug should go on hold or it should go on partial hold, and these are the reasons. So the conclusion, the, the final conclusion, after we do that, the non-clinical studies are adequate, uh, safety margins are fine, we recommend um, safe to proceed, or like I said, we recommend clinical hold. Now, after that, uh, let's say we told them that everything is okay and the sponsor is going to start their clinical trials. So while they start their clinical trials, we still have contact with the sponsor all the time. So long-term toxicity studies will be done and they will be submitted to us as needed. If the genetic toxicity was not all done at the beginning, it will be done now and sent to us. And whatever data is collected, it will be, um, you know, uh, sent to us. The reproductive toxicity study also, and the carcinogenicity, if it is recommended, they have to start the carcinogenicity study. So there's always a contact between us and the sponsor all during uh, when they're doing their clinical trials. And the other thing is when we let them um, go with their IND and they start their clinical trials, we can put the sponsor on hold any time. If any of those studies there was a problem, if they're doing their chronic study and let's say the monkey started dying, there is a reason for that. So uh, we will put them on hold. Clinical trial will stop until they figure out what the problem is. So the, the sponsor can go on hold any time during the drug development. <clears throat> and if there were other studies recommended, they need to do them then. Then when everything is done, the NDA uh, would, um, uh, comes usually. For us as Farm Talks reviewer, we really don't have uh, much to do at the end because everything has, most of things have been uh, sent to us during the development. So if we've reviewed everything, so there's very little for us to do. There might be carcinogenicity study comes with the NDA, or maybe the last Ripro study comes and we need to review them. But our uh, part is important, um, working on the label. Because there are uh, parts of the label that come, the label comes with the NDA at the end. And parts of the label are uh, from um, animal data like the carcinogenicity studies, the mutagenicity, the impairment of fertility, all that information on the label come from the animal studies, not from the clinical trials. And also the pregnancy. We used to have categories for pre pregnancy. We do not have that anymore, so we have to uh, explain, uh, you know, do a risk assessment of how safe it is related to pregnancy. And there's also part of the label um, uh, titled Animal Pharmacology and Animal Toxicology. And what we put there is if, if there is a, an effect that was seen in animals that were not seen in the clinical trials at all, we put it there just in case when the drug is being used by thousands and thousands of people, something shows up. So. So the conclusion of the NDA usually, if we have 
everything we need and there's no uh, uh, issues with the carcinogenicity and the label is fine after negotiation, then um, we recommend approval. It's very rare that at the time of the NDA, uh, the drug does not get approved because of um, non-clinical issues by then. Most of the time it's CMC usually or clinical issues, some toxicity was, it was seen during the clinical uh, trials. Okay, and then post-marketing. So uh, sometimes uh, there will be, after uh, uh, approving the drug, there might be a need to do some mechanistic work. It could be, you know, clinical trials or it could be uh, farm talks. We might ask them for a mechanistic work to explain something that we didn't see. It, it does not prevent approving the drug, but it's good to know this information. Uh, and that would be like a, a post-marketing. Like I always say, no drug leaves FDA. When it comes into FDA, it gets on the market, but it's still, it's still connected to FDA. We still get reports. We still get safety reports. Nothing, nothing goes out. OK. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you um, a case study here uh, from an IND was for neuropathic pain. And this was a phase one first in human healthy volunteer study to evaluate safety, tolerability, and PK in a single ascending and multiple doses. And um, the doses were from 50 milligram to 200 milligram of a single dose and a multi-dose. And the sponsors do that all the time. They send a, a, you know, a protocol for a, a single dose and a multi-dose, but when it's first in human, we concentrate on the single dose first because we let them do the single dose and when that's OK, then they move to the uh, multi-dose. And they did uh, safety pharmacology, genotoxicity, general toxicity studies. They did seven-day oral, 14-day oral in rats and dogs. Everything was fine. They did everything that was needed to be done. A 14-day rat had good um, uh, dose response uh, doses. And not dose response. I mean, they had good doses. They went up nicely. The same thing with the 14-day dog. They had good doses. And um, th these studies were done in a lab that we were not uh, familiar with. FDA was not familiar with this lab before. So the safety pharmacology study had no effect. Genotoxicity was negative. The general toxicology studies, the dog and the rat, had a lot of issues. The studies were not done well. And um, in, in the rat, we had death at the low and the mid dose. And the animals were not, they were um, poor overall condition and uh, due to dehydration. And then when they did pathology, they had vacuolations in the nervous system tissue, the brain, the optic nerve, and lesions in the lymphoid uh, tissue, which was in other tissues, which was, you know, concerning. So there was no Noel in the rat. They saw that in all the doses. The, um, the dogs, there was a Noel. So it was not, not bad. It wasn't a bad study. So the sponsor explanation was that the lesions are associated with dehydration, dehydration, but provided no supporting reference. They didn't say why it was dehydration. They didn't say was it the animals were dehydrated or was it the slides when they looked at was dehydrated. I mean, that was like really, you know, we didn't, we didn't know what to do with this data. We even asked uh, other, you know, pathologists that does this happen and they said no, this, this is not, you know, it doesn't happen <laughs> before. They haven't seen it. So what we ended up with is the rat with no safety factors, no, there's no Noel. The Noel for the dog was not bad. So what do you think? Hold or no hold? Hold? Okay. So hold. So and, and this is exactly what we told them because there was no no well established in the 14-day study. Although you attribute the lesions to dehydration, it's not possible to root out uh, to, to rule out neurotoxicity, right? Related to the drug. So therefore, the available non-clinical data is insufficient to support dosing in humans at this time. So that's a hold. Now, when we put somebody on hold, we have to tell them what they need to do to get off hold. And this can get really difficult sometimes, because we cannot just tell them, you're on hold, OK, go away, you're on your own. 
we have to tell them in the letter, you need to do this, this, this. So this is what we told them, that you need to repeat the 14-day study in the rat, and the pathology evaluation need to be peer-reviewed, get another pathologist to look at that. Also, that you need to do a recovery um, group to see if this is reversible, and also uh, go lower doses so you can get NOL. And we also asked them whether, does it cross the blood-brain barrier, this drug, or not? They could go back to the old study and figure out if that's happening or not. And also, if, if they really think this is dehydration, well, convince us, you know, provide reference that evacuations could happen because of dehydration. And then we also, because we're not familiar with this lab, the lab was outside of the U.S., we contacted our compliance uh, group and we asked them about the lab and they have not inspected that lab. They don't know anything about it. So the sponsor went and did, repeated the study in a good lab and there was nothing, no evacuations, everything was, was good. It was a good study, you know, it, it was a good lab. And we also talked to our um, uh, compliance people, and they said this is a good lab. It has been inspected, so they recommended that we take this study. So they got off hold that way. And you see the rat, uh, the NOEL was 100 from the second study, and we had some good safety factors, so everybody was happy. And then, uh, yeah, th this is the uh, our inspectors. Um, they they will they put their the, the second the first lab we had problems with because we had other studies done there they put that on their schedule to go for inspection to, of that lab in the future and the study was accepted and that's it thank you very much if you have any questions All right, if you recall, those of you that were here yesterday, if you have questions, please come on up to the microphone and stand up. I'm also going to go grab a microphone from the back of the room to uh, run around. If you want to raise your hand rather than lining up, I can try to find you. While we're getting situated in the room, let's take our first online question, please. First online question. Is there a difference in the specifications among the ICH and FDA guidances which we should follow? Um, was that a difference between the ICH and the FDA guidances? Not, not really. It's, uh, it could be, um, if there's an FDA guidance, it will be a guy, there, there isn't an ICH guidance. You know, it, it, they will be different. Like the first in human uh, dose guidance of the FDA, there's nothing equal to that in the ICH guidance. Next online question, please. For oncology drugs, do we need to perform genotoxicity and carcinogenicity studies in animals? Well, it, it, depends, it depends on the drug. Uh, it depends what What's the, uh, the, the drug for? What kind of cancer? A lot of the cancer um, oncology drugs, the drug itself is genotoxic, so there's really no need. And also, if it's a, for a very uh, serious uh, tumor that the patients might not live for a long time, there's no need for carcinogenicity studies. But if it is uh, something like, um, let me think of... Um, you know, um, tamoxifen that might be given for breast cancer for, you know, preventive. That, that should be, give, you know, carcinogenicity study and genotoxicity study should be done. And actually, uh, oncology has their own guidance. It's, um, I think it's, it's um, S9 is the guidance for oncology, and uh, that would be clear in there. Okay, we have our first question in the room. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Yu Chin Tsai from MS. Um, great talk, thank you. Um, I have two questions. First one is that um, do FDA have a recommendation certification for the non clinical lab? Like, um, like, is it some kind of certification that we can look into when the vendors is trying to look for CRO? Uh, for the for the contract labs, you yep. mean where to do the studies? Yep. 
Um, no, I mean, we really don't recommend, we cannot really recommend you go to this lab or not, but I think in the compliance, our OSIS group, if you go on their website, if there is an inspection that was done to a lab and there was a problem, it will be on the website. I see. So you, you will know what's going on and then you can ask this, this, the CEO um, uh, themselves, the contract lab, whether they have been inspected by the or OSIS? not inspected uh, by FDA. I see. Yeah, yeah, or I mean EPA also inspects um, labs, so you can ask them about that and if they had any problems or not. But we can't, I mean, I as a reviewer cannot really recommend to you to go to this lab or not. I see. As long as they have been inspected by the FDA and it's good. Okay. Yeah. And the second question is, um, the, is it possible one species, one species is especially susceptible to some kind of drug? So the um, sponsor actually switch species to other, like non in that case, uh, to other rodent species and then find the toxicity is fine. You mean to do one species only if it's accepted? Is that oh, your no, point? sorry. Um, like in the case that you are sharing, uh, is it possible it just happened to the rat and when you do the like a okay. rabbit? Yeah, okay. it, it could be. Yeah, I, I mean, you see toxicity sometimes in one species, you don't see it in the other species. But depending on the toxicity and, uh, of course, with our experience, if we know that the, ca the rats, this is something normal in the rat. You, you usually see this. Um, you look for, did you, did you see it in the control? We ask the lab for historical control. Is this something normal in the rat or is it uh, because of the drug? But sometimes, I mean, you do see the toxicity in one species and not the other. But if, if it's from the drug, we can't ignore it. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be in both uh, species. I see. Thank you. Okay. And I'm coming over to the other side of the room. In the meantime, question from online, please. When is the best time to conduct the MTD study? When is the best time? I think it's one of the early, early on studies to be done. Then it's the multi-dose study, just go high enough to make sure that uh, you reach the MTD. Okay, question yeah. in the room, please, go ahead. If you're, con if you're developing a drug exclusively for the pediatric population, um, do you recommend doing juvenile animals in the toxicology program, and how do they actually fit in? I mean, are you doing both adult and juvenile, or well, exclusively it, it, juvenile? It, it, it depends. Um, in my division, we have, uh, um, I'm in the antiviral division, and I've got a SRV, you know, for children, pediatric, but our medical um, like to see a small clinical uh, trial in adults first, before going into um, juvenile. So to do that study, you need to do animal study to support the adult, so it will be adult animals. And then before you go into pediatrics, you do the juvenile. But sometimes if you go, I mean, it depends on the division and the indication. You might just, uh, they might not ask for an adult uh, clinical trial, just uh, uh, pediatric, so you need to go straight into pediatrics, so then you'll do juvenile animals on like two species. All right, let's take an online question, please. Is there any ongoing effort to replace animal safety studies with the donated human cells? <laughs> um, there is, I mean, there's a lot of work on uh, the human chips and the human, the human organ chips and the human cells, but I don't think we are ready to completely replace those. We don't, we don't see, um, sponsors don't send us anything, you know, uh, like that. So we still, you know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and if you, <laughs> if you want to stretch your legs in the room, come on up to the microphone. Otherwise, hold your hand up and I'll bring it around. Let's go with another online question, please. Can you tell us if there are any differences in the terms of pharmacology and safety assessment between small molecule drug and biologics? If, if there are any differences, is that the question? Yes, there are uh, differences. The, uh, there's a guidance for, um, a special guidance for uh, biologics. It's the S6R2, I think it's now. 
and that's special for um, biologics. And when you when you do biologic um, drug development, uh, you need what's called a relevant species. Um, and sometimes you can uh, get away with one species if that's the only one that's relevant and not two species. So there are, there are differences between biologics and small molecules, definitely. Okay. Online again, please. Does a Carson genicity study have to be completed before the NDA submission? Uh, depends on the indication and the uh, division, I want to say, because that, that means it depends on the indication, actually. And uh, again, in my division, uh, a lot of time they are, the carcinogenicity study are post-marketing, but they have to be started before the NDA is submitted, so that we know that they've started the studies, but then they can come later. In other division, depending on the indication of the drug, they want them with the NDA. Again, there's a lot of um, a lot of these questions. It's very good to ask them uh, during a pre-IND that I talked about, or just contact the division that you know the drug is going to go to that division, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer all these questions. Next online question, please. How long is the carcinogenicity study, and when would it basically start? In other words, what phase of development would that start in? Well, it's uh, how long, you said? Uh, the rat study is usually two years, and then the mouse study, there's different. I mean, a mouse study could be two years. If it's a transgenic, transgenic mouse study, that's usually six months. And um, also, when it should start it, it depends uh, what the division is requesting. Should it be submitted with the NDA? So then the sponsor need to do their calculation. I mean, the study takes two years. It takes another year, at least, to be analyzed and the report to be written. So a two-year rad study will take between three to four years to be done. So um, I think that's up to the sponsor to uh, figure out. All right, and again, any questions in the room, just raise your hand. Let's go with our next online question. If a drug such as a cell therapy is cleared significantly faster in animal models compared to humans, how should toxicity studies be performed? Cell therapy? I'm sorry, I, I really cannot answer that. I don't have any experience with cell therapy. Maybe we should do biologics next time. Cell therapy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next online question. How do you treat mutagenic impurities in phase one? How do we treat them in phase one? Um, well, I mean, there's, there's also a guidance. It's, um, what is it, it's the M7 guidance about impurities, and it all depends on the, what the impurity is, what's the, it's mutagenic, you said, so it depends on the um, uh, level of the impurity, and I recommend uh, just following the guidance, the M M7 guidance. Okay. Next online question, please. Do we have to qualify all the impurities and degradants before going into humans or before NDA filing? Uh, before NDA filing, yeah, yeah, definitely. And what was the other one before? Uh, before going into humans. It's before yeah. NDA. It's actually, this is more um, chemistry question. Because the chemistry, they're, they're, um, they're usually look at those impurities, but definitely before the NDA. And any questions in the room? It looks like we've gone through all the online questions and questions. In the, oh, yay! You're supposed to raise <laughs> it this high. There you go. This might be a similar question to the cell therapy one. Uh, if you have a locally delivered gene therapy or oglionucleotide, uh, 
how does that play out in the animal talk? Other it's questions? It's a completely different center. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get Seaburn involved. I know. Could you um, discuss a bit or uh, the process on the special protocol assessment for carcinogenicity studies? Um, sure. What, I, I'm not sure what you want to um, know. I mean, you know, the, you will submit, usually the sponsor will submit, um, they'll send us a letter that they're going to submit a special protocol for carcinogenicity. And then after a while, they will submit um, the protocol for the cars, plus what studies they're basing on their um, uh, doses. So it's usually uh, either a six-month study or um, a three-month study that they've done, whether either in the rat or in the mouse, um, depending on what the protocol is for a rat or a mouse. And they will submit them to us. Um, we, what, we, as a reviewer, we will review that. We usually write a small review, and we go to our CARS committee. We have a, a, a CARS committee that will uh, discuss it. it. It's mostly the, the study design, which is usually, you know, it's the same most of the time. It's the doses that is really important, and that's what they look at, the doses. And they either... Um, accept what the sponsor is, uh, you know, planning and using, or uh, they lower the doses, or they increase the doses, or they do the male and different from the female, all from the toxicity and from our review. And then we send a letter to the sponsor with our suggestions. That's how it works. And then when the, when the study comes in, we review the study, and we go back to the CARS committee. And the CARS committee tells us if this is a good, good study, it's been accepted or not accepted or anything. Okay. Right here in front, already. Excuse me. Well, I'm multitasking. Uh, so, it, localized delivery that uh, just gave me an idea uh, for localized delivery of small molecules. Uh, so, let's say there's an intramuscular injection or, or anything like that. Does that change anything about the carcinogen, uh, carcinogenicity studies or? or the required dosage, or, or things like that, or? Not or really. Design. I mean, if you're going to, are you going to do the study with the same route of administration? Yes. So, yeah. so, yeah, so. The idea. okay. Yeah, as long as you don't kill the animals. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have to take into consideration that they're going to be, hopefully, living for a long time, you know, so, yeah. No, it doesn't. Uh, it's the same as, as you would look at it as it was oral. All right, we've got another in the room, but we had another one come in online on the way. According to the guidance titled, Estimating the Maximum Safe Starting Dose in Initial Clinical Trials, FDA Guidance 2005, proteins administered intravascularly with MR greater than 100,000 Daltons. Such therapeutics should be normalized to milligram per kilogram. And they want to confirm that for standard MAB, should, should there be scaling by milligrams per kilogram from animal to man? You mean for, for large molecules? It's the question is for large molecules. That's it's correct. Yes. Okay. That was, <laughs> it's for the large molecules. <laughs> that was nice and easy. All right, please, right here. Uh, does the FDA website contain inspection reports for GLP labs outside of the United States? Um, I was just looking, and I couldn't spot where on the website I might find that. Oh, uh, it, it should be if they have been inspected. Depends all on the inspection. Or should be. Hey, any other questions in the room? Don't be shy. Ray, any other questions online? By the way, I will be around uh, uh, during lunch. Yeah, more questions. Always ask. One more. Okay. Uh, would you happen to know if the FDA is working on a guidance or similar to help investigators determine MABEL? Determine. Nabel. What is it? Nabel. N A B L. M A B E L. Oh, Mabel. Uh, Mabel. Uh, no. No, there's, there's no. I mean, it's our. <laughs> uh, no, because I know why the question. Because Europe has one. Europe has um, a, a new uh, guidance on Mabel, but actually, our um, uh, 
guidance for calculating the first inhuman dose, you know, sort of covers Mabel from even at that time, which is using very, very, very small dose to start with biologics to avoid some toxicity. But no, there's, there's no um, special guidance in the works. All right, and that's all the time we have for questions. Please help me thank Hanan for coming and speaking with us this morning.